So this case is called airline subscription. Our client is the leading American airline uh, and they are considering to launch, uh, considering launching an initiative that will be a brand new initiative to the industry. And it is basically a subscription service. So the idea here is that customers who fly regularly would pay a certain amount per flight, uh, per year to fly actually, instead of paying for each flight that they have. Uh, and they would do that only for domestic flights. So they want our help to advise them on whether the airline should or should not pursue this new venture and why. So for this case, you can consider that we are only looking at the domestic market. So the domestic uh, market of flies. And I want to start the case by asking you, what would you like to start analyzing uh, or what would be your initial hypothesis for that? Mm -hmm. um, my initial hypothesis would be that this would be an attractive and possibly profitable market for us because currently we are seeing a lot of businesses going into the subscription based model and, uh, you know, it would make sense for us to, you know, sort of incentivize our customers to stay with us um, through a subscription model. Um, so my initial hypothesis would be that it's attractive. However, you know, in order to um you know assess if it actually is that scenario i do want to ask you a few questions if that's okay with you sure please okay um so as you mentioned that this is a completely new um you know trend in the industry and no other airlines uh they have they haven't done um this type of a model before right Exactly. Yeah, it's brand new to them and also for the industry. Okay. Okay. Understood. Um, did uh, the airlines do any kind of customer research in order to find out um, if such a model would be attractive for the customers or not? They haven't for now. Okay. Understood. And um, are we planning to do this for all uh, classes of flyers, such as business class, economic class, or is it specific to one particular class? Good question. They have not decided so far. Okay. Sounds good. And just to clarify, um, the airlines is currently operating only in the U.S. and we're just looking at the U.S. market, the domestic flights. They operate in the U.S. They also have international flights. But for this uh, new like, business model, they are focusing only on domestic flights. Okay, understood. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, sure. Can I just get a few minutes to gather my thoughts? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. In a time of record high inflation and low returns for the S&P 500, you need to diversify your portfolio with an alternative asset class that performs well during times of high inflation. The solution, Masterworks, the platform for investing in contemporary blue chip art by renowned artists, including Picasso, Banksy, and Warhol. Did you know that two thirds of the world's billionaires allocate 10 to 30% of their portfolios to art? And now, for the first time, ordinary investors like you and I can do the same by purchasing fractional shares in world-renowned art. Over the last 26 years, contemporary art prices have outperformed the total return of the S&P 500 by 164%. Are you ready to diversify your portfolio? Click the link in the video description below to skip the waitlist and start investing today. Okay, I do have a few thoughts and uh, if you're ready, then I can share those with you. Yeah, please. Okay, um, so in order to really see if this is an opportunity worth pursuing, um, that is to have a subscription-based model for domestic flights, um, I would primarily want to look at three categories of uh, you know information um, first, I would like to start off with the market opportunity. Second, um, the financial implication. And third, I would like to look at competitors. Um, so first, when looking at the market opportunity, um, I know that we are primarily looking at the domestic market. 
So ideally, I would want to see what the domestic flight market size is like and how much is it growing. You know, for example, in U.S., I know that there are there is a huge domestic market. So I understand that right off the bat, there is a huge market opportunity. But just to be sure, I would also want to look at the international uh, flights market size because, uh, you know, when compared to the revenue or like the growth, it just might be possible that the international market is just more attractive and there is a bigger demand for it. Um, moving on from market opportunities, I would want to look at the financials, um, especially, you know, I would want to sort of do a comparison of what is the price um, of tickets I am charging to the customers who are flying uh, business class or first class or economic class and what is the price I am looking to charge for the subscription-based model and then I want to sort of make uh, get, get an understanding of what our customer lifetime value would be and also compare it with the costs we, we would be incurring for each flight and whether does that sound profitable or not. Um, you know, I think that is going to be um, a huge um, driver of making the decision of whether we should be pursuing this opportunity or not. Finally, I would like to look at um, the competitors because this is a subscription based model. If and in my head, since everyone is doing it, it's very attractive. So I would think that the com competitors might also venture into this area. So I would really want to understand how they might react to it. Um, I know we are a leading airlines in US, but I don't want this to be an opportunity for competitors to surpass us. Um, so just want to see if there is any chance that they might be able to offer a better subscription service to our customers. Um, so if that happens, is there any way in which we can increase the switching costs uh, for our customers if they want to move from our airlines to our competitors? Um, so these are the, you know, the broad categories that I would want to look at. But I think initially to make sense, if this is at all an opportunity worth pursuing, I would like to look at, you know, the market opportunity, specifically what the domestic flight market size is like. Um, and, you know, if we have any information on the growth. So do you think that we have any data on 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 these? Yeah, we have some data I will share with you in a moment. Just to answer what you said uh, about the competitors, you can consider that for now, we don't have any competitor doing that or thinking about doing that. But I agree with you that we could have like a risk of competitor response to this initiative. Um, with the market data that you asked, we have some data on how much uh, our customers spend right now per flight. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. per domestic flight, and I will share that with you. Okay, so that sounds I will great. share my screen. Let me know if you can see the, the table. Yes, I can see it. Perfect. Can, can you still see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see okay. it. Um, so from what I'm seeing is that there are four types of tickets that we uh, provide as an airlines and uh, that is the average price per ticket that we have like in the bracket. So the budget um, class is probably sold for $112 on average. Money they would expect to pay. Um, so just to clarify, is it, you know, is it is this like the subscription fee that a budget flyer is expected to pay on an annual basis? Is that correct? Exactly. So you can consider that this column means how much they would at first be willing to pay for a subscription subscription plan with two domestic flights included per year. Per year. Yeah. Um, sorry, two domestic flights? Uh, 12 domestic flights. Sorry, I believe it's 12. true. Yeah, 12. Okay, 12 domestic flights. Okay, that sounds good. And on the absolute right, uh, column we have percentage of customers who would purchase um, that's great so uh, what I would want to do is to figure out which customer segment is the most attractive for us um, in terms of you know revenue potential 
And in order to calculate that, uh, what I will do is um, I will just a second. Um, do we have any data on how, like, what is the size of each customer segment? Uh, we don't for now. Okay, so uh, do I just assume uh, that we have the same number of customers in each segment, let's just say 100? Yeah, but one question, like before we jump to numbers, like conceptually, what do you think about what you're seeing right now? Like of segments that would adhere the most to the new uh, subscription plan, uh, mm -hmm. considering how much they are paying right now, how this could affect our revenue, etc. Like before you do calculations. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I would want to, you know, find out that uh, for each of the classes, if they were to take 12 flights on the, you know, on like a on each flight basis, then what is the total revenue that we would be getting and compare that with the subscription revenue and see if that makes sense to us. Makes sense, yeah. Okay, um, so I guess what I'll do is uh, I'll just calculate how, what is the total revenue I can have um, on the average price per ticket if, uh, you know, if there are 12 flights. Does that sound like a good approach yeah okay okay great so we have budget coach business and luxury um for the budget we have 112 per ticket and if there are 12 flights then i will have Uh, one thousand three hundred and forty-four dollars in revenue from one customer. Um, from coach, we have two forty-seven per ticket. So for twelve flights, we have two forty-seven times two fourteen one eight nine two thousand four. Two thousand nine hundred and sixty-four. Um, for business, we have three ninety per ticket. With twelve flights, I get three ninety times twelve. That gives me the. Uh, four thousand six hundred and eighty and for luxury i have 613 per ticket times 12 six, two, so i get seven thousand three hundred and fifty six from luxury so if I, you know, compare it with um, the money that they are going to pay uh, through the subscription model, um, if I go one by one for budget, if we get, uh, if we take the subscription route, then we would be getting less money. Um, so this is not that attractive. Moving on to coach, again, we would be getting almost a thousand dollar less from each customer not that attractive as of a segment when it comes to business um we would be getting 680 dollar less per customer not attractive um but when it comes to luxury we would be getting almost about um uh 700 dollars more through the subscription model so luxury i think would be the segment that we should target um, for pursuing a subscription, uh, you know, based model. However, in order to, you know, really understand if this would be, um, you know, a viable segment, I, I can see that 24% of customers would be willing to purchase a, a subscription um, 
service. So I would really want to understand what the total segment size of the luxury segment is like so that I can, um, you know, fully understand what the entire revenue potential is like. Okay, so makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so building on that, that you just said that luxury seems to make more sense uh, mm -hmm. and the others perhaps not so much. Uh, we have some more information that we have here. Uh, can you see the second table? Yes, I can. I can see the second table. Okay. Uh, yeah. So here we have the information on like the volume of each segment as you, as you ask it. Uh, mm -hmm. Just want to make clear the last column where you see like revenue with airline subscription. This is basically the percentage of tickets that would migrate to the subscription plan. Okay. Okay. Understood. Um, all right. So that would mean that, for example, if I were in the luxury segment, then I can expect out of the 3,000 you know, almost 4,000 number of tickets sold, 24% of tickets can possibly come uh, or shift to the subscription-based model. Great, that's it. Uh, and with that in mind, could you calculate the like before and after of the of the of each segment with the plan? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, can I just get two seconds to gather my thoughts on how I can approach the calculation? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what I'm I'm going to do is for luxury, it's, you know, it's making sense to me because, um, you know, we would be earning more. Um, so there, even if like after the mic, sorry, it just went away. After the migration, I, you know, I would be able to gain more revenue than I was initially. Um, however, uh, for the other segments, do you want me to calculate how much of revenue I can possibly lose um, if a certain percentage of customers migrate to subscription-based model? Great. So what you're telling me is that looking at the numbers and with what you have calculated, you already know that luxury would be the only one with incremental revenue. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, you don't need to continue. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, so what I'll do now is to, that I'll just calculate what is the total revenue potential from the luxury segment because that just makes more sense, you know, in terms to fi like find out what is the incremental revenue that we would be getting from luxury. Um, so is it okay if I round off the number of tickets sold from luxury to 4,000? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so if I get 4,000, um, the, I'll just find out what is the additional revenue that I will get. And that would be 8,000, which is the subscription price minus 7,356. Can I round it off to, um, 7,400? Yeah, you can. Okay. So that gives me 600 and uh, 600 of additional revenue that I can have. And I have 4,000 of tickets sold out of that if 24% migrate to the subscription model. I have 16, 1, 8, Nine hundred and sixty tickets that I can possibly um, get uh, from the subscription model. So, in order to find out the total revenue, I will multiply nine sixty times six hundred, and that gives me Five hundred and seventy-six thousand. Does that sound like a good number to you? Yeah, makes sense. Okay, that's um, that's good. Um, I I mean, considering that it's an airlines company, um, I think this is this would be like a very 
small increment to the entire, you know, possibly billions, billion dollars of revenue that they are generating. Um, and it seems, you know, profitable till now because, you know, con- I, I don't have any information on the costs. But if I assume that they have been profitable on the luxury segment till date and we are pulling in more revenue, then I'm guessing that it it will be an even more profitable venture. Um, However, I'm just, uh, you know, worried to see uh, the, you know, the adaption of uh, the subscription service because only 24% of them would be willing to move to a subscription-based model, which is actually the lowest out of the other, you know, out of all four segments. Um, And it's also like the smallest segment size that we have. So is there any way in which we can revisit the prices that the other, uh, that we have sort of calculated for the other segments and find out if we can charge them at a higher price um, so that we can get like extra or in higher incremental revenue from those segments. So do you think that's an option that we can possibly consider? Yeah, actually, I have something to ask you on top of that. Uh, you told me right now that luxury with those numbers would be the only one where we would have like incremental revenue. But I yes. don't know if you paid attention at the business because business here in the first table was the column the middle column was the money they would expect to pay and here we have four thousand that you use it for your calculation in the second mm-hmm. table take a look mm-hmm. at the price again mm-hmm. yeah so it increased from four thousand to five thousand actually oh this is great yeah i actually did not notice that thank you so much for um highlighting this point that is great so this means that we are actually getting more revenue higher incremental revenue from business and uh you know the if if we go the subscription sorry if we go by the per ticket route then for 12 flights the amount of revenue that we expect from each customer is 4,680, I can round it off to 4,700. And uh, if we charge them 5,000 for a subscription-based model, then the incremental revenue that we can expect from them is uh, 300, which is great. Now I can just calculate the, the number of tickets that I can expect for them to migrate to a subscription-based model, which I'm I'm guess like I'm thinking it would be higher because it's seventy eight percent out of twenty twenty six thousand almost. So the business number of business tickets would be twenty. Is it okay if I round it off to twenty six thousand? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, and can I round off seventy eight percent to eighty percent? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the number of tickets that I have is four. Eight, 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 hundred tickets, uh, which can migrate to the subscription based model. So total incremental revenue from business that I can expect would be. 20,800 times 300, and that gives me 624, 2, 2, and that's actually 6.2 million. Um, so the total uh, revenue that we can expect to get from the subscription-based model, it's um, 6.82 million. Does that sound like a... Okay, great. Makes sense. Okay, so 6.2 million actually, I mean, looks attractive to me, Um, you know, but, uh, you know, in order to like go forward with it, I assume that there would be certain 
you know, costs associated with, uh, you know, if it's a different, if it's a subscription model, there might just might be certain investments when it comes to software, or we might have to make changes in the website. We might have to train our employees to better manage this, um, the subscription-based model and also to acquire the new customers and, you know, market this new subscription service and to market the benefits that they will have from this service. I think that is also some costs that we are looking at. So do we have any understanding of, you know, what is an amount of costs uh, we are expecting to anchor in order to, um, you know, market this product or make this product viable? Good question. So we don't have an exact number of costs that they would mm -hmm. expand uh, with the subscription plan. We can mm -hmm. consider that the cost would be like uh, around at the beginning, around 10 percent more of what they spend right now. And then they believe that after one year, they wouldn't have that cost anymore. Um, I want you to I want you to ask you a few things. So you mentioned that in the lecture segment we only have like twenty four percent of demand for this new program, right? Yeah. Uh, while in the business segment we almost have eighty percent. Yes. Can you like hypothesize on what would be the drivers of some segments wanting this more, like being more willing to change, and others not so much? Mm hmm. I think uh, my hypothesis would be that the business class flyers, since they fly more frequently, so uh, it, you know, that that is why they just might be inclined to get that subscription based model because in their head they are getting more out of the money that they're spending. So I am hypothesizing that they are possibly going to fly more flights in a year than just 12 flights. Whereas for the luxury segment, um, I think they are possibly not so frequent flyers, but whenever they fly, they like to get a very luxurious experience, um, which is why getting a subscription based service does not make sense to them. So I think uh, what I would want to look at, um, you know, since you highlighted this point, I would want to look at a more fair view on how many flights we think the business class flyers will actually fly a year because possibly it just might be more than 12. Okay, got it. So you mean that like each uh, person perhaps in business would fly more than 12? And yes. the subscription plan that we are offering now, it's only for 12. So. If you were to see that they would fly more than 12, what this would mean for the for the subscription plan or this wouldn't have any impact? Mm -hmm. um, so just to clarify, you're saying that the subscription uh, in the subscription based model, they can only fly 12 flights. And, uh, you know, considering that limitation, what is going to be the implication for the business class flyers? Yeah, so initially, the what the company wants you to do is provide a plan only with 12 domestic flights per year. So mm -hmm. if you were to see that business on average fly more than 12 per year, what would you do or like how this could impact us? Okay, so if the business class flyers actually want to fly more than 12 flights a year, then I think what, you know, if we don't do any, like I, I can see it, affecting us in two ways one is if we don't do anything with this and if we find an opportunity within that so in the first point if we don't do anything about it then uh we would be losing out you know a potential greater revenue opportunity we might be losing out on you know uh you know if, for example, if we go into the subscription model and if our competitors copy that model and offer a better, um, you know, sort of package deal for them, then it just might be possible that they move into like to the competitors. And uh, if we sort of modify our model, uh, you know, for them to fly more flights, not just 12, but more flights within, let's say, five the $5,000, then we incur you know, higher costs. So that would impact our margins. 
versus if we plan to do something about it then in my head i think it would be a great opportunity for us to provide different subscriptions for example for five thousand dollars you can fly 12 flights for six thousand dollars you can fly 15 flights so increasing that price incrementally so that I, I think that would be a huge opportunity for us to you know provide them with a better value of of their money and also get even greater revenue for us yeah makes sense and we also saw that luxury is only 24 percent uh, inclined to to go for the subscription plan as you noticed so what, how if you were to market this the subscription plan mm -hmm. what would you focus on besides the thing that like you have 12 flights that you can use per year and this will cost x what else would you offer or like suggest for these customers to make them want the subscription plan um specifically for the luxury segment for any like don't need to be specific okay okay understood um can i just get 10 seconds to find some ideas sure i do have a few ideas i think um in order to communicate the benefits of going with our subscription model i want to look at in two aspects one would be what we are offering in terms of like the the product itself and like the services that we can offer and second would be like what kind of promotions or the kind of communications that we can make. Okay. So um, in terms of the the services that I can offer, I think there is a huge opportunity for us to, you know, do a lot of things there. First, um, providing very attractive destinations, um, you know, for example, if we have like the luxury flyers, possibly they go to vacations like in Hawaii or, you know, in London. So we can, you know, give them, uh, you know, attractive rates if they are uh, going to those destinations and uh, tell them why, you know, sort of communicate the benefits of why a subscription based model would make sense to them economically. Um, second, I would also uh, want to focus on the ease of purchase because this is a subscription model. Ideally, they don't have to go through the, um, you know, they don't have to find the um, the most, the lowest cost flights every time. They can possibly just schedule a flight with one click and don't have to worry about how much it's going to cost. And so I would want to highlight that. We can also provide different value added services such as maybe certain hotel tie ups, um, pick up, drop off services, um, everything of that sort that we can add to the subscription based model and tell them that this is what you will get as, you know, a member uh, of this American Airlines subscription. Uh, when it comes to promotion, I think I would want to sort of harp on the experience that we seek out to deliver as an airlines, for example, for the luxury flyers, really harping down on what are the, you know, luxury experience and flight experience that they can achieve or that they can receive in our flights. And uh, also like all the additions, uh, service additions that we can have, such as the value added services, the attractive destinations. I think all of these we can pull into our promotions and use that or leverage that to attract um, more clients. Great, okay. So can you please provide a recommendation for the airline company? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I would recommend the airlines com company to um, target the business class and the luxury class flyers um, for this subscription-based model because we have calculated and we have found out that we can receive a potential revenue opportunity of $6.2 million from these two segments. However, we also have to you know, do a further analysis on the cost because we know that it's going to cost 10% more. Um, however, um, you know, if it, in 10 years there is no additional cost and it possibly will continue to be a very attractive opportunity for us. Certain risks that I have in 
in mind is that even though there are no competitors right now, however, it's a very easy model to replicate. So I would be concerned as to how competitors are going to react to it. Um, a second risk that I have to keep in mind is whether customers would be willing to you know adapt to this subscription model um so the next steps right now would be to really uh put a plan of action in place um especially with our uh marketing team as to how we can really focus on acquiring these customers and uh make them migrate to a subscription based model and figure out what would be the right price and possibly do some more benchmarking to see if we can price it at a higher price or not okay got it okay so this was our case how, how did you feel about it um I, I okay let's see i think with the questions i was struggling a bit because i i felt like you provided me with all the information so I wasn't sure like what else do I ask? Um, I think framework wise, I could have done a bit better. I possibly missed a few few things there. Um, math calculation wise, I think you also had to like sort of direct me a lot. So it wasn't truly led by me. Um, so, but I wasn't sure if that is how, you know, this was supposed to go with the case. Also, I did not go back to my hypothesis. Like it turned out to be, you know, right. But I think I could have done better with, a, you know, more bolder hypothesis. Possibly I could have said that this is going to be a good opportunity or uh, attractive opportunity for, you know, business class flyers or something like that. So, yeah. Great. Okay. So at first, I believe you did a great job with the case, honestly, because you have a very good structure uh, and you're communi you communicate very well what you're thinking. I agree with you with the three part that you missed some things there. I also saw what you said about like overcomplicating the math a little bit. Um, but let's discuss step by step, like from the top until the recommendation. Um, when we say like interviewer-led case, in terms of content of case, there's no difference between interviewer-led and interviewee-led. The key difference of those cases is that they expect you to like propose where you want to start the case with and also keep guiding the case in the sense of like, okay, I just calculated that I have this information. Here's what we can see next or here's what this means to us. And you keep like moving the case forward is not about like not needing any help doing the calculation or any guidance, because at the end, every case we have like a script of what we need to test and what questions we want you to answer. It's not like a blank uh, like word paper where we have like, okay, this is the initial of the case and then you go wherever you want. Uh, we will still uh, need to ask you some specific questions. What is important is that you are going in the same, uh, like on the same journey, you know, like you are not completely uh, pulling the case to a different direction that is not that important. So in that sense, I believe you did a great job because you were asking things and suggesting things that were totally aligned with the case. And that makes sense. Um, moving to your other point of hypothesis, right? Uh, I wouldn't sweat too much with the hypothesis part. Uh, honestly, if you are not comfortable with doing hypothesis and or like for some cases you are not that comfortable, you don't need to do it. Uh, this is from my experience talking with people that interview in MBB company. They say like, if the person is not comfortable, I prefer them uh, not do the hypothesis and just do like a great tree of like what they want to analyze instead of saying like, okay, uh, my hypothesis is that we should do that and they don't know how to connect with the tree. And this is something that you did because you provided a hypothesis that the subscription plan would make sense. But then when you constructed your tree, you never connect connected that with the hypothesis. So if you wish to use the hypothesis, you need to make sure that you will say something like, okay, so for my hypothesis to be true, I will analyze those three areas. So I believe you said market, uh, finance and competitors, right? 
um, then you should say like, so for, for it to be true, the market needs to be growing domestic flights uh, and we need to see that customers are willing to go for a subscription plan. Then the finance, this new uh, subscription needs to be profitable, etc. So you need to tie your structure, your tree, like the items of your tree to the hypothesis. So if you want to do that, you should do it in that way. And when you were like doing the case, if you can refer to the hypothesis when you have like a new insight, then that's good. If you are not confident with the hypothesis, that's fine as well. Try to go with like a very uh, complete structure and tree. Like, okay, here's what I want to analyze to be able to come with an answer, come up with an answer. Does that make sense? Okay, so going from the opening part, the opening is everything that happens after I tell you the statement. So regardless of the way I ask you after the opening, so after I tell, tell you the statement, I told you like, um, so I want your help to analyze what would you look at or what is your initial hypothesis considering that. Uh, regardless of how I say the beginning of the case, you should always start validating what you heard and confirming some things. Uh, you don't need to rush into like providing a hypothesis or already saying what you need to analyze. You did that a little bit, but it was great that you picked that pick it up and then ask it some questions. Like, okay, my initial hypothesis is that, but let me ask you some questions. Um, you wouldn't need to provide the initial hypothesis and then ask questions. You can say something like, okay, so just before I answer you, I just want to confirm some things. Uh, so there are three key things we should do at the opening. The first one is confirming the information you heard. It's not about like repeating uh, to the interviewer what you heard, but it's about validating like the key information that you receive. Like, okay, our client is X. They want, to, they want to evaluate if they should pursue this new subscription plan. That is something totally new to the market and they are the leader in the market right now. Is that it? Yeah. So you don't need to repeat everything back, but it's important to make sure you understood. The second thing you, and you did that, the second thing you need to do and you didn't do, and it's very important, is validating the goal of the client. So you know, a lot of cases we have like, okay, client wants to understand if they should uh, launch this new product or they should uh, get into this new market. We should always ask why, what they are looking for, because we always assume uh, is profitability or is market share or something like that, but we should always validate because sometimes it's profitability, but it could be also something else like, oh, they are looking for profitability, but also they are looking to targeting a new set of customers, for example. So always validate like, okay, and do we know uh, what exactly is the key driver that our client wants to start a subscription plan? Uh, and even if I tell you like, okay, it's profitability, always follow up with a question to try to create a metric of success. Like, okay, and do we know how much profitability they want to achieve with that? Like a percentage or a specific number? Because then during the case, if you calculated the incremental revenue as you did, and I told you at the beginning that they want to achieve 50% incremental uh, profitability and you calculated that the incremental revenue would be 20%, then it's already like, okay, probably like a no go in the way that we are seeing right now. So if you can, at the beginning, try to have a metric that you can base on. And then the third thing you should do at the opening is the clarifying questions. And you did a good job there. So you ask it if they are, uh, were already doing that, if the subscription plan would be for all classes or not, uh, if they did a search with customer. So very good questions. The clarifying questions is not something that you should do like just to like check a box. It's something that is supposed to help you set you up for success. Like understand the context of the case. Like what are what are you solving for? Uh, when the case is a very different one, like very different industry or very different business model, then it's where you should make the most usage of the opening and the clarifying question. Like, okay, uh, I believe that this company makes money right now uh, by selling uh, airplane uh, flight tickets and then um, having a profit on that. Does that make sense or not? They do something else that we should consider. So this is kind of like validating the business model, how they make money. Or do we know where this company is located or where they are uh, thinking about launching these, like just in a specific part of the country or in the whole world? So some questions that you did ask, but this is important for almost every case that you would do. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so good job at the opening. Just don't forget to ask the goal of the client. Uh, the structure part, you ask it for some time, you use it two minutes, that's fine. You should use between one and a half and two and a half minutes. Um, and here, uh, you were top down. Are you familiar with top down in Missy? Okay, so, okay. So top down is when you first state the buckets before you go into detail in each of that. And you did that. This is very important because it's helpful for the interviewer to understand like, okay, she's going to talk about market, uh, financial and competitors. Now she's talking about this one and the other one. If you just uh, start and say like, okay, I want to see market and then you detail market and then you move to the other one. Sometimes it's hard for us to see, to understand everything that you were tackling if it's three or four or five buckets. So you were clear with your three buckets. So that's good. Uh, and when you can make the transi transitions like as clear as possible, for example. So I want you to discuss uh, three key things. So market, um, the financial part of the subscription plan and the competitors. It's starting with market, this, this and that. Moving to the financials, this, this and that. So it's very clear to the interview where you are at all times. Um, so good job at being top down. Uh, and here it comes what I told you before about like if you use it, hypothesis, connect your uh, each part of your tree with the hypothesis. And you could do that by saying like, okay, so for a hypothesis to be true, the market needs to look like this or that, for example. Then the missy part. So missy means that your buckets, they should not overlap. And when you are discussing, discussing your buckets, they should be at the same level. And with everything that you have within each bucket, you should be able to tackle the whole problem. So like, okay, if I have this problem and I analyze these three things, I should be able to provide a good enough answer. Um, here, I believe you were not so messy. You had market, financial, and competitors. They all make sense. Um, but for example, inside market, uh, you could have mentioned some other things like uh, amount of customers that would be interested in that, for example, uh, if you had any data on that. Or even in financials, you could have broken financials down to, as you were focusing on profitability, you could have broken down to revenue and cost. And inside revenue, you would have volume and price. So you mentioned price. You could focus a little bit more on volume, like of percentage of our customers that we already have that would be willing to move to this plan and also like would we be able to attract new customers that we currently don't have for this initiative with this new plan. So this is something you could have mentioned, but even uh, your structure makes sense, but I would prefer a structure like, for example, um, market, then the new venture, like the subscription plan, and then you could have uh, customers and competitors. Uh, and my point here is like in market, you discuss what you said, like the overall market, it's growing or not. Then in customers, we discuss like what are customers looking for you know, in this market? Who are the customers that we have? Is only like uh, often uh, people that fly very often or like the luxury type competitors, what you discuss. But inside the subscription plan, there are more things to analyze than just profitability. So profitability is one thing, but other things is like, okay, what are we going to offer in this like product or service? Like what we mentioned at the end of the case. So the subscription plan is not only about being profitable, but what would actually be included in that, how we would do that, how we would need to market that. Uh, where this would be available. So more things related to how would you make the subscription plan work um, and the features that you should have at it. But of course, profitability would be the key thing inside that bucket. But when we are discussing like the way to restructure, there are different ways that you could do it. Your structure, market, competitors, and financials make sense. I would just suggest that inside market, you add like something related to customers or inside the profitability, inside the volume part of revenue, you mention customers, but you should mention customers at some part, not only the lifetime value. Uh, so what is important is that your buckets are at the same level and you are inserting in your buckets everything that would be important for that decision. Because if we make the decision without knowing if 
Like who are our customers? Uh, are we going to be able to attract more customers that are not currently our customers now? Uh, what are they looking for? Probably we shouldn't make that decision. Make sense? Uh, a tip here is when you are doing your structure, like, okay, I have market, I have financials, and I have competitors. Take like additional 20 seconds to see like, am I missing something that is important for this decision? Like, am I tackling all the key points that would be part of this decision? Uh, usually those additional 20 seconds, they're helpful before you explain your structure. But what I would like to commend you with the structure is that you provided a very good level of color so what I always say is your structure should be very tailored to the case. You should have the color of the case and not only use a generic structure that it could be used for a lot of cases. And a lot of people do that to like, okay, profitability is revenue and cost. So price and volume and variable and fixed cost. Okay, this is applicable to any situation. Uh, you should make it tailored to the case and you do that by providing examples. And you did a good job there, for example. Okay. You mentioned customer uh, lifetime value. You mentioned the number of flights that they do right now. Uh, you mentioned other airline comp uh, that would be our competitors start offering this service. You mentioned the cost for each flight. You mentioned the domestic flight market. So you are adding elements that I cannot forget that we are discussing like an airline subscription problem. And this is very important. Even if you are using like a framework that is very like uh, well known, it's okay as long as you change the buckets to this case situation. Uh, you suggested starting with the market for domestic flight, that was good, and you asked data on that, that made a lot of sense, a good place to start. Um, I shared with you the first chart, like the first table with the information. A tip here for every time you are dealing with like tables or charts and like data to analyze, at first, like just make sure you understand the columns and what they mean. But then, unless it's like a very straightforward, like a pie chart with true information, like with very few data in it, ask for a couple of seconds to make sure you like can draw insights out of that. Because what a lot of people do is that they discuss what they are seeing with the interviewer. Like, okay, I see here that business is paying $112, I'm making it up, I don't remember, but like is paying $112 and they 20% um, of them would be willing to move to the other category. Okay, I can see that as well. Like this is on the table. So that's not a problem with doing that, but that's not great. What is great is that you can take 20 seconds and you can come back with insights. So for example, Okay, so from what I saw here with this information, I believe we should focus on luxury because on average, luxury would provide more revenue for us because currently they are paying $600 and they would pay uh, $8,000 for us in the subscription. However, I can see that for coach segment and the other segment, it would be the opposite. They are more interested in the service, but we would actually lose revenue. So I'm coming back with insights. Like I already understood the information and I'm, I'm providing you what is important on that information besides only reading the information with you. Uh, so you said that you wanted to calculate the customer segment that would be like um, most detractor. That was fine. But with the level of information that we had, here, I believe you overcomplicated because you didn't need to actually calculate all the numbers because you have there like 600 and you know that it's 12 flights and you can do like an easy, like quick uh, multiply, multiplication there and say like, okay, I can see here that it, or it's, it seems that luxury would be more uh, interesting for us while the other one would be not so interesting considering what they're paying. You don't actually need to like stop and calculate. Um, Unless you say that and then I tell you like, okay, can you please calculate exactly uh, how much that would be? Because I didn't ask you at any point like, okay, so please, at, at least at this part, uh, please calculate what would make sense or not. Uh, it was a good insight from you that like, I see here that for some it wouldn't make sense, but instead of asking for time and doing the calculation, you could already say like, okay, I see here that from these numbers, uh, it seems like this would make sense and the others would not. Do you want me to like provide you an exact number of the revenue or the difference? Okay. Uh, 
great. And then it was very good that after you did the calculation, you provided like a, a so what that we call every time you do a calculation, you should do two things. One is providing the full answer. Don't a lot of people just say the number uh, of things. Always provide the full answer. Like, oh, I see here the 50% out of this like segment would be willing to move to that and we would have X incremental revenue. This is like a full answer. Don't always just say like, okay, it's 50%. Like, what is 50%? So the first thing is provide the full answer. And the second thing is provide the so what. A lot of people believe the so what is saying, like, if the number is good or bad. Uh, it's not about that because most of times we don't have that knowledge to say, like, okay, $300 sounds like a good number. Like, I don't know that. Um, unless at the beginning of the case, I told you, like, oh, they are looking for more than uh, $200. Then $300 makes sense then you should definitely connect this to the information I provided you in the beginning of the case. Unless that is the case, what is important once you found the number is that you say like, okay, what this means to our client. Okay, I calculated, I'm, I'm making this up, okay? It's not on the case, but just for, for example, like I calculated that they would have 300 as an incremental revenue. Then you should say something like, okay, they would have 300 as incremental revenue. Um, do we know if they were looking at a specific amount of revenue for this segment? Or do we know how this compares to other uh, competitors that are doing the same thing? Or can we check if there is any space for us to increase the price and then like increase the revenue we would have here? Or even like, okay, I calculated the revenue and you did that at some point. You said like, okay, we calculated the revenue, but we should look at the cost to then be able to understand the profitability. This is great. Because we would never never make a decision without like discussing the cost or discussing how uh, this if this number actually makes sense for the client or not. So just remember when you calculated something, always provide the full answer and what this means to our client. What should we look next? What information should we look for to be able to compare and assess? Or if we already had some data at the beginning that we can relate to. Great. Then we had the second calculation that was like the before and after of revenue in each segment. Uh, you did a good job here because you asked it for time. Uh, a good way to approach calculations where like the interviewer says like, okay, please calculate that or please check these numbers is to always ask for some time uh, to put together a rational. Unless again, the calculation is very easy, then you don't need to ask for time. But uh, if that's not the case, ask for a couple of seconds, come back to the interviewer and say like, okay, here's my rationale. Here's what I'm thinking about doing here. Uh, I will calculate first the, um, how much we were making right now with the segment and then uh, the percentage that would migrate out of a plan, etc. Does that make, make sense or not? Like without the numbers, but just the rationale. And then if the interviewer says like, yeah, go ahead, then you start doing the math. While you are doing the math, you don't need to like say everything out loud that you are doing and you did a good job there. So you don't need to keep saying like, oh, two times two is four, then I will consider this or that. You don't need to do that. What is important that you do is that you try to validate intermediate results. So like, okay, uh, if you are calculating profit, you have to calculate like revenue and costs. So when you calculate revenue, you can come back to the interview and say like, okay, so I saw here that the revenue is something around like, it's $500. Does that make sense? Yes. And then you move on and you calculate the cost, for example. This is important for two reasons. One is you mitigate the chance of getting like the final number wrong. And a lot of people do that. They are just like calculating everything and then they get at the end and the number is wrong. And if I tell you like, oh, that does not sound right. It's very difficult to find where you made that mistake. So if you are validating like just those big numbers, then you mitigate that, that risk. And the other thing is that you don't leave a lot of silence in the room. If you are just saying everything that you are doing, like, okay, two times two is four, and then the revenue is 500, and now I will calculate the cost, the interviewer will never interrupt you to say like, oh, no, actually, this is wrong. So if you want to have like a sense of validation with the number, always say like, oh, does that make sense? Am I sounding too off? And you did that. So good job for the calculation. Um, one tip here, at some point you needed to calculate like 24% out of something. Always validate if you can round. You did that for most part, but for some you didn't. And like 24% is almost 25 and it's a quarter. So it would be 1000 and you did all the calculation steps. 
So validate if you can round and then just like estimate the number because here would be like less than 5% out of like an estimation. Every time is less than 5%, normally you are good to go. Um, let me see what else here. It was good that you made some comments on top of like the luxury segment uh, saying that it would be profitable, but small. Uh, then you said about like the cost. This is what I, I was talking about. So what? And you did a good job there with this question. Uh, I added two questions just to see like brainstorming out of you. That one was uh, the drivers for people wanting or not the plan. Very good answer for business and luxury. Uh, and then you asked it about the average number of flights uh, it was a good question, and then you were able to provide like good insights on top of that about like providing different uh, subscription plans. The other question was, what would you offer to drive more demand? In this question, I wanted you to be a little bit more structured, and it was good that you did that because you asked it like for a couple of seconds, and you come came back with like a true bucket structure. This is great because the first question was only like, okay, what do you believe are the drivers there? So this is like a conversational question. You can just like talk to me about it. But when I say like, what would you offer to drive more demand? It's better if you take some time to think. If you are not sure during the case, you can say something like. Okay, so do you want me to just like discuss this with you or can I take some time uh, to think? It's okay to ask that. In your case, you asked it for some time. It was a good call. Uh, you tried to be structured. So you had like two aspects. So the product and service and then the promotion side. Uh, two bucket structures are very good idea to follow on these brainstorming questions in the middle of the case. There are a lot of two bucket structures that you can try to use, for example, Financials and non-financial aspects, internal and external elements, advantages and disadvantages. For this case, what you pick makes sense. Um, what you could have also mentioned would be something like, okay, I would focus on convenience, uh, on like um, promoting the convenience, on added value, value-added service like extras and like affordability. So this will vary in like case to case, but if you have two buckets, that's great. Uh, I like it what you mentioned. Just one mistake at the beginning when you were discussing product and service and you said like providing attractive destinations and you provided like international destinations as example, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and this is out of the scope of the case because we should only focus at domestic destinations. I'm, I, I'm not sure, but I believe you mentioned one that was uh, out, of the, out of the US. So just one small thing. Um, but then the easy of purchase made a lot of sense. Uh, also good that you mentioned the value added. Um, here you could have focused a little bit more on the flight experience itself. So like, okay, they could have uh, preference to book flights. They could have preference to choose seats or a more or easier way to do the checkings. Or they could purchase like uh, bundles with uh, food inside the airplane, I don't know, but ideas that considering the flight experience and not necessarily something outside of the flight experience like hotels and other things like that. Uh, but overall, good ideas and good structure. Uh, the recommendation part, the structure was perfect. The recommendation is always like the recommendation. You should always start with the recommendation, so very top down, like yes or no. Why? and then like risks the next steps. You did that. The beginning of the recommendation was very strong, but then you started at the end adding a lot of things that you didn't need to. So the recommendation should be very, like just a synthesis of what we saw and like answer the question of the case. Every time you need to provide a recommendation, go back to your mind and say like, okay, what was the question of the case? In this case, the question was like, should they start the subscription plan or not? So the answer should be like, yeah, they should start the subscription plan, focus only on business and luxury class because we calculated X amount of revenue increase and you did that and you said like that. Then as a potential risk, I would like to point out that we haven't calculated the costs associated with this. So as a next step, I would like to suggest that we do like a detailed analysis on the costs associated with the subscription plan and also that we stood uh, the possibility of providing different subscription plans for each type of segment, customer segments because this could increase our revenue. That's enough. Uh, you mentioned the cost. 
Uh, but then you restarted with like different risks that was like, oh, competitors answer, customers adapting to the model. That is not so important in this case where we haven't even analyzed the cost. Like we will never decide on pursuing with these if we haven't analyzed the cost. So it's not that your risk doesn't make sense, but if you mention the cost, this could be one risk. Um, and then you move on to the next step. And the next step that you added was like put a plan of action like to acquire customers. I would say that probably for any case, put a plan of action could be a next step. So I also wouldn't go with that. So try to make something like, if you mention a risk, try to use the next step to mitigate the risk. So if one risk is that we have an analyzed cost, definitely the immediate next step should be analyzed cost. Or if I chose to focus on the risk that customers could not adapt to the model as a next step, it should be like analyzing, uh, starting some pilots or customer interview to understand how they could answer to the model or something like that. No. But don't add like a lot of risks and then a lot of next steps because the interviewer could lose your point there on the recommendation. So very straightforward. So just to wrap it up, very good structure overall the case, very good communication. Uh, don't be too focused on the hypothesis, but if you go with that, try to make the like things relate to your hypothesis. Uh, when you are doing this structure, do a double check to make sure it's easy so you are not missing any specific bucket that is important to the situation. When doing the calculations, try to simplify a little bit like, okay, can I estimate this that, and I would still get the insight and focus on insights. Like this is where the value is. And on the recommendation, like be very straightforward. Understood, clear. Thank you so much. This was extremely helpful. I really enjoyed this and uh, I've taken note of all the feedback that you have given me and uh, I hope to incorporate it for my next casing session. Thank you.